Okay, uh, very good morning to everyone. On behalf of the organizing committee, Department of Chinese Language and Culture, Vishwarthi, I welcome you all to the first technical session of this two day webinar aimed on understanding China from the multidisciplinary perspective. The theme of this session is contemporary Chinese politics which will be chaired by Professor D.R. Deepak, and we have the honor to have him among us. He's a chairperson of Center for South Asian, Center of Chinese and South Asian Studies School of Language, Literature, and Cultural Studies, JNU, and whose specialization is on Sino-Indian studies, including history and culture, Chinese language and literature, China's socio-political and economic issues, and who have edited and written numerous books and book chapters in this area. With due respect, I request you, sir, to chair this session. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Shivandu. Uh, uh, very good morning to uh, all of you uh, for this first session uh, on uh, contemporary Chinese uh, politics. We have, uh, you know, quite a, a diverse uh, range of topics. Uh, uh, maybe except Javin is uh, only odd man out who is looking into <laughs> India's periphery, uh, uh, you know, uh, and others they are focusing on uh, uh, China as such. Uh, uh, Rajiv will be focusing on uh, this China's people oriented uh, approach, which is very much part of the discourse nowadays uh, in uh, Xi Jinping's uh, uh, speeches. Uh, and uh, Dr. Avinash uh, uh, Godbole, so he will be focusing on uh, China's Asia strategy. So maybe China's pivot to Asia, which we, we you know, uh, uh, call it uh, quite often in our, in our discourses nowadays. And uh, then we have Sanjeev uh, will be talking on uh, understanding China's economic reforms in 18th Party Congress. Uh, uh, which indeed, uh, you know, have been very, very uh, impressive as it was flagged out by Ambassador Mishri uh, in the morning uh, session. And then we have uh, two of our own uh, students uh, now, you know, working as assistant professors, uh, Ms. Saheli Chatraj. Uh, she will be focusing on uh, understanding China perspective from the developmental state. Uh, and then Swati focusing on Three Gorges Dam. Uh, I think uh, as uh, such, India-China uh, relations, or maybe the China uh, as such at this point in time, so we are at the uh, crossroads. Uh, and it's extremely important uh, you know, to understand what is uh, going on uh, inside China and what are the drivers you know, the way they are behaving and uh, maybe uh, position ourselves, uh, how we are going to deal with this, uh, uh, I will say repositioning of China, uh, because uh, the message from Chinese side, it seems that it is, you know, very, very clear, not only to India, but also uh, to the world. And uh, I believe it was uh, coming on if we uh, try to decipher what they have been writing uh, after the peaceful rise or the rise of China discourse um, in early 2000 and then elaborating it further, uh, you know, by 2006, that they are not going to be the mood spectators of developments across the globe, forget about uh, Asia. So it's uh, quite interesting uh, to note uh, and uh, a couple of days back on 5th, I was part of one of the annual conferences of uh, Global Times. Uh, in fact, interestingly, the theme uh, initially, it was, uh, you know, uh, uh, the Chinese uh, uh, theme was that, uh, roughly if translated into English, uh, should 
China use its heavy hand against India or force against India. This was initially uh, uh, titled that way, but later on, maybe the Chinese scholars, they thought that it is too aggressive, uh, you know, uh, so they changed it, uh, India-China relations at the crossroads. And, uh, and, and, and I made a couple of points. Uh, I'll just reiterate, I, I, I believe that uh, uh, the balance of power, you know, uh, or which, uh, uh, you know, Dalit uh, Zorawar, so he, uh, in his new book called Power Shift, uh, it uh, elucidate uh, that because uh, of the uh, balance of power favoring China, not only in Asia, but uh, across the uh, globe. I think that is one of the indicators. And of course, the strength comes from its economic drivers. And if we see uh, the last decade, you know, from 2010 to 2020, uh, China's uh, the GDP, you know, from six trillion dollars, so it increased to 14 trillion US dollars. And comparing China's uh, this uh, this this increase, India could not even double it, you know, from uh, uh, 1.7 trillion to roughly 2.8 trillion in last decade. And COVID. Uh, I think it has uh, accelerated that uh, situation. So I think it is uh, from this that the Chinese to draw their uh, strength, uh, and we can see this uh, earth symmetry, you know, uh, proliferating into technology, defense, uh, economy, and various other areas. And uh, and and and, uh, and of course, I think uh, the uh, the the happenings on our borders. So they are also resulting from this uh, because it's not just bilateral or regional. I believe geopolitics is, uh, you know, one of the reasons. And this is one way of uh, China's thinking, you know, uh, uh, telling the world that, no, they have uh, uh, arrived on the stage and uh, so-called the, uh, the, the offensive uh, uh, diplomacy. It is also, uh, uh, you know, one of the spin-offs of uh, maybe this uh, uh, balance which is favoring them. Anyway, I think I will not delve into that. I will be listening to uh, what you have to, uh, you know, speak on this. Uh, I think uh, we will restrict each speaker's uh, uh, to 15 minutes. And I hope, uh, you know, all of you, you observe that uh, time so that we have some uh, time left for uh, uh, questions and uh, uh, answers. So maybe once uh, you reach uh, at uh, for the 13 minutes, so I will, you know, caution you that you need to wind it up within uh, you know, two minutes or so. Uh, so with the, uh, these uh, words, so may I have the pleasure to invite uh, our very own Professor Jabin uh, from Shibnada University. Jabin, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Professor Deepak. Uh, and uh, thank you to the organizers uh, and to Avinash, uh, to Avijit especially for inviting me. Uh, I am particularly pleased to be at this event uh, because I see uh, names that I would not usually see at other seminars and conferences, so which I think is particularly uh, fantastic. Now, um, before I start off uh, on this uh, topic, I think I'd just like to sort of take off from where Professor Deepak left off and say that, uh, you know, change in the name of the conference that Professor Deepak attended a few days ago, actually that original name actually reflects reality much more so than any changed name. And uh, these developments uh, in Chinese global power, uh, you know, uh, should actually be referenced to what is happening inside China. I mean, it is incorrect, I think, to call it simply a result and outcome uh, of balance of power politics uh, or to limit these developments to simply structural factors in international politics without reference to internal developments and internal drivers in China. Both, of course, need to uh, work together, in, uh, but both 
which is why I think this particular conference is important because it discusses a great deal of internal developments in China. And I, 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 know, I don't know if anybody from the Indian embassy is attending, but I should hope so, because I'm sure there'll be much of importance that will come through. Uh, now, uh, Professor Deepak called my presentation the odd one out in this session, but I think it would speak somewhat to what Avinash is going to uh, talk about, as well as perhaps Rajiv's presentation that follows. Now, uh, in my presentation, I want to identify some broad patterns of Chinese behavior in Nepal. Number one, uh, China is determined to have the same degree of influence that India does. China wants to match India's actions uh, in every respect that it can, because China sees itself also as a neighbor of Nepal, and China sees itself as, uh, you know, uh, the same amount of influence that India has in Nepal. So in terms of political actions, uh, you know, Indian, uh, the Indian ambassador or the Indian government has constantly been involved in Nepalese politics over the decades. So similarly, today you see the Chinese ambassador uh, in discussions with Nepalese political parties, in discussions with different factions of the Communist Party of Nepal, to try and ensure that you know uh, the current prime minister, I mean, remains in power, or that he sort of stands so far in a peaceful manner without splitting the ruling party, for example. Right. So that's one example of how China is trying to exercise its influence. The other, of course, something that we have known for a very long time is the religious dimension, which is how China has about uh, gone uh, on uh, trying to develop the tourist facilities in Lumbini, uh, the birthplace of the Lord Buddha. On the cultural front, uh, again, you know, China has to invent uh, new forms of uh, or new stories about how India, uh, Chinese and Nepalese cultures are similar. Uh, the, you know, you look, look at the ambassador's Twitter page, you'll, talk, you'll see that she talks about uh, food similarities between Nepal and China. Not Nepal and Tibet, mind you, but Nepal and China. Uh, she talks about uh, how uh, the Lantern Festival in China is like the, I think it's called the Tihar Festival in in uh, Nepal, you know. Uh, so, and also, uh, you know, continuing with this thing is also the security dimension. Another area where India has been very strongly um, influential in is the security uh, dimension. And here, uh, if India and Nepalese army have a very close relationship, then China is determined to get in on that uh, relationship with the Nepalese army. So the latest visit of the Chinese defense minister, uh, Wei Fengha, to uh, Nepal, for example, is one sign of this uh, effort. Uh, there's also been uh, an attempt to develop a, dev a relationship with the Nepalese armed police force. If India, Nepal army relations are very close, then China is trying to develop a closer relationship with Nepal's uh, paramilitary or armed police force. And this really has resulted in the flow of Tibetan refugees from China or from TAR into Nepal, uh, reducing it by massive numbers. Similarly, also disaster diplomacy. You know, China and India have both been involved in post uh, earthquake reconstruction efforts and also in COVID diplomacy now. Um, the second part pattern is the Chinese attempt to provide alternatives to India or to step into gaps that India has created by its inability to keep promises or by its insensitivity. Uh, some years ago, we saw that uh, Nepal and China opened up a, a cross-border internet and optical fiber link, providing an alternate internet gateway for the uh, Nepalese uh, through China. Uh, you know, the Indian... Uh, Army has uh, the Indian government has been talking about developing an academy for the Nepalese police for a very long time, but that has still not come into come to fruition. I mean, it's over a couple of decades old. But for the Nepalese armed police force, the Chinese created a training academy in less than two years, in ahead of their promised time. In fact, another uh, example might be uh, the question of railways. India has been talking about a railway between Indian Territory and Kathmandu for decades again. But uh, while a railway between Lhasa and Kathmandu can be quite a difficult proposition, the fact that Chinese railways are practically reaching the border with Nepal seems to give this idea some fillip that it's quite possible at the rate of going that the Chinese will have um, a railway connection to Nepal much before India go. A third pattern is that 
China tries to deflect or dilute Indian opposition by floating some pie in the sky. It talks about Nepal as an economic bridge, or it talks about India, China, Nepal, trilateral cooperation. Essentially, this is also an attempt to keep the, the Americans out of uh, uh, Nepal. Uh, but, you know, to have, a, to actually have any of these ideas develop, the Chinese must also be open to India developing closer ties to the Tibetan region, which the Chinese are not allowing. So we call this uh, a deflection uh, of Indian opposition or an attempt to dilute Indian opposition. Fourth, there are uh, specifically Chinese initiatives. The Belt and Road Initiative is one, uh, but there's also the attempt to integrate the Tibetan and Nepalese economies, not just as part of BRI, but overall. Uh, there is active Chinese economic support to Nepal's northern border districts. Uh, and if you were to consider the fact that despite all these long years of relationships or ties between India and Nepal, the economic relationship between India and Nepal is still very heavily informed. Uh, there are some modes of conversation between the two sides, yes, but it has not really progressed or developed to the extent that it could have. Uh, you know, and then, of course, there is this latest attempt or latest uh, measurement of Mount Everest height. I mean, this is something only Nepal and uh, China can do, obviously. My last part, and I'll try and finish it well before 15 minutes, is that uh, the last pattern I'd like to highlight is specific uh, Chinese characteristics in terms of the foreign policy, which is basically the theme of my presentation, also in terms of the switch between a MOFA-led foreign policy to a party-led uh, or party-dominant foreign policy. Uh, for example, you will find regular online commentary or interviews given by the Chinese ambassador uh, to Nepalese uh, newspapers, both in English and in Nepalese. Now, this is something that all ambassadors do everywhere, but uh, the frequency, the sheer frequency of the Nepalese ambassador's pronouncements uh, or these commentaries in the Nepalese media is something that is quite astonishing. Essentially, this is to a large extent propaganda and a lot of untenable statements or deflections uh, or uh, not answering direct questions. Uh, then, of course, I mentioned the Nepalese ambassador's role in, um, uh, you know, talking to Nepalese political parties. Now, all of that, uh, quite a bit of that actually comes straight from the United Front Work Department's playbook. Uh, the Nepalese ambassador is also much more outgoing than I'd say any Indian ambassador in the recent past. I mean, she's singing with her colleagues, uh, she's doing tourism photo shoots, etc., and so on. I mean, any ambassador can do this if they want to, but it's not happening. Uh, a third point here is the role of the International Liaison Department uh, of the Communist Party of China, uh, which has conducted classes on Xi Jinping thought for the ruling Communist Party in Nepal, both in September last year, as well as this year, despite COVID, on an online platform. Uh, also important to note is that the ambassador has actually been critical of Nepalese press on occasion. When the Nepalese press has made critical statements or uh, published material uh, about China's role in the COVID pandemic, uh, in, in allowing the COVID uh, pandemic to spread beyond China's borders and so on. And essentially uh, what's happened is the Nepalese uh, newspaper editors had to come together and uh, I tell the Chinese embassy to not disparage or threaten uh, the Kathmandu Post editor in this particular case, editor in chief, uh, for I mean for uh, for expressing freedom of uh, you know expression uh, for uh, exercising their freedom of expression. So uh, in terms of the party state dynamic, uh, I conclude by the fo following points: uh, in foreign policy towards Nepal. Uh, the impact of Xi Jinping's centralization of power at home. There is the uh, effort to push Chinese wisdom or Chinese, which Xi Jinping talks about in the 19th Party Congress document, uh, to push a Chinese model of foreign relations, uh, of uh, internal developments and foreign relations to other countries. And Nepal is actually currently a very willing partner in this exercise. Uh, and also one reason why China 
finds its presence in Nepal very important is because of Chinese view of foreign policy as a state of ideological conflict between the United States and increasingly, I would say, and inevitably with India. The Communist Party system in China cannot coexist with other democracies. And I say this very clearly that it cannot coexist because there is no uh, coexistence would mean there will be always the open threat of what they call peaceful reunification, a peaceful, uh, uh, peaceful evolution, sorry. Uh, so this also needs to be taken into account. Uh, this very strong ideological framework with China looks at its foreign policy uh, efforts also needs to be taken into account. And uh, this has to be aligned in any foreign policy or bilateral relationship that China has with other countries. And I think this also has some lessons to offer in terms of what the ambassador was saying in the morning about what direction India-China relations will take in the future. And I will stop with that. Thank you. So you're on mute, sir. I, I said thank you. Thank you for saving three minutes uh, this time. You know, <laughs> maybe compensating yeah, for the last. From the last conference, sir. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was. I was wondering. You know, yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, you know, wonderful exposition, uh, flagging out various uh, points uh, why China is uh, doing what it is doing in Nepal, and uh, you know what are the uh, options for India. I think I would have. Uh, uh, you know, like to listen to more maybe in uh, Q1, especially uh, the kind of capacities China has built and maybe uh, China considering India as a strategic competitor, uh, maybe that thinking, maybe it is not uh, fully blown out as yet, as I understand it, maybe in future, uh, maybe some years to come. So maybe we have to uh, be prepared for that, you know. Uh, so maybe we can take up these issues in Q&A. Uh, now, may I have the pleasure to invite uh, next speaker, uh, Dr. Rajiv Ranjan. So he is assistant professor, at College of Liberal Arts, Shanghai University. And uh, Rajiv, over to you. Fifteen minutes time. Thank you, sir. Uh, let me, on the very onset, uh, thank Professor Abhijit for inviting me this uh, to this conference. I think is as uh, Dr. Javin has said, Professor Javin has said, is like a kind of like you can say that the kumbh of Chinese studies where uh, different uh, scholars from the different university have assembled here. So I think it's very um, uh, nice to see all good friends and even we, we can make a new friends also here. I see some new faces. So I think it's the uh, first time that I'm here at Santi uh, China Bhavan, uh, Santi Niketan. So, uh, and I'm talking about uh, the first, I have divided my presentation in two parts. First part is talking about the, the leadership selection, or we can say that how the, the people or like the students are recruited in the party system. And then in the second part, I will be talking about the, the leadership transition, taking a clue from the 19th Party Congress in the end. Um, as we know that, uh, like all the democratic country in the world, China also claims that its rules in the name of the people, uh, 1.3 billion people precisely. And then, and they have like membership that has grown uh, according to the last uh, count in December, 2019, uh, 91.914 million. And if you uh, compare when the, in 1949, when the PRC was established, uh, they were like kind of like not much uh, membership uh, around 4 million and even the membership were restricted to kind of like uh, exploited classes, peasant workers, and then some section of intellectual classes. But this membership uh, grew uh, in, in the in after when the Tang Xiaoping uh, kind of like denounced that, uh, declared and denounced and declared that the intellectuals are part of this working class, freeing from any political suspicion. And, and so you have like, the membership coming from a different uh, technical groups, a specialist, teachers, and that made a kind of like roughly a 50% of the total population of CPC. But when, how to become a member of a communist party, that's a, I, I thought that it would be uh, interesting to say a bit because uh, I have now my own experience in China, not from reading only the, the literature that exists, 
but also how the Chinese people, the students apply for this membership. Now I was when I was teaching in one class in China, uh, in, in China, and then I got to know that there is there are students, a group of students, they asked me that can they stop for like five minutes class? And then there was a kind of like a student groups, a kind of supporting a membership of one or two people to be inducted into the party. So that's the first process that you have to be supported by your classmates, your, your classmate that supports you to be a member of that party. And after that, then again, you have to write an essay and the format and the content of the subject have, of the essay have changed a kind of like uh, depending on the time. Like now, when someone writes an essay to become a membership of the party, then you have to write up like New Era, Xi Jinping chart and all that, corruptions and all that. And this gives you a kind of and that, that essay is like uh, kind of like evaluated by a team of experts from the party and then they decide whether or not you are going to be inducted into the into the party so this is the first step of your party application and after this essay then again it starts a training session for one year that's a one year training session that the students have to attend various classes on party on the communist party the culture the the morality and different things and between you there are like uh, the communist party members that is checking your background whether you are you have a high morale whether you are a helping persons and they also interview not only you but also your classmates your teachers your supervisors they all in kind of like check your background and then after one year the induction you are granted a probationary membership of the party and then it starts a verification of your characters characters then it goes the police goes to your uh, like village or home wherever you are based and then they check thoroughly so even if your father and mother has been uh, punished for any crime then your membership can be kind of stopped your probationary membership can be cancelled and Writing the essay is not so easy because if you just find to on, on, uh, on the, uh, you know, like what kind of essays are, there are varieties of essays. There are like even the coaching center for, for uh, teaching you how to write an essay because this is very significant part of your application process. And like this is so uh, hard that uh, the, some uh, estimate says that the acceptance rate of this membership is like kind of, on par with Ivy League call, uh, universities in the US. So, so that becomes again a very tricky business to be a member of this CPC. Now coming back, not everyone can apply and become a membership. That's a, now when they start, like they take students from the middle school also, but only the best, the best who is doing best in their studies, the best who is doing their in extracurricular, so only one or two can be inducted into the party. So there is a kind of like a queue, a waiting list for like, I know some of the students in, in my university or in different university who is waiting for four years to five years to be inducted into the party because it's not very a small uh, kind of like exam or like anything that you can be inducted uh, just by like we have in a different system by just applying or taking a membership or by missed call. So it's, it's it's a very difficult process where uh, some prof some scholars say that they are like trying to like it's a kind of like a China model, but there are like a lot of um, scholars have criticized this model also. Uh, now coming back to now uh, this uh, the leadership transition that we have seen uh, that is happening like every ten years from and. Like we were anticipating that in 1940 Congress, the two members will be inducted into the Politburo Standing Committee, and that will be a kind of like a president and then the premier. But it did not happen. Now, if you see the last 1940 Congress, where the new five members who were inducted is where from who were not retiring. So, like there is also a kind of a, a not a written, but a kind of like conventional. Uh, rule that is like uh, uh, it's like like 
uh, if you are a 67, then you can go. But if, if you are 68, then you have to retire. So that principle have been uh, implemented even in 19th Party Congress. And so <clears throat> from in 19th Party Congress, if you see, there are two members who were not promoted into uh, the, the standing committee of Politburo. One is the military and one is uh, the, the, the female. So that is a kind of like there is a kind of uh, uh, a gate or a gatekeeper who stops the like females and the military into uh, a standing committee membership. But as such, the, all the members who are like not retiring and they were eligible for promotion, they were promoted. Now coming back to uh, again, like if you see that, and then there is also age factor and there is also a factor of generation. Like Xi Jinping belongs to the the fifth generation, where the Li Keqiang belongs to the the fifth point, like five uh, generation. And if you see the mem the age group in the current, uh, the Politburo, there are like uh, 25 members. And then you have like, and there are also like, you have like Ting Shui Xiang, and then you have Chang Yoxia, who are the, the from the military. And then you have, uh, and Sun, Sun, Chun, uh, Sun Chun Lan. So might these three can be not be promoted into the next coming, a uh, standing committee in uh, 2022. And then you have like, and there are others members who will retire. So that leaves you uh, uh, like, uh, Ting Sui Xiang is like from military, so they cannot be promoted. Then you have Li Xi, then you have Li Xiang, like it's uh, 58. Then you have Li Hang Chong, then you have like Chen Chuan Ko, and then you have Chen Minar, Chun ha, uh, Hu Chun Hua, and Wang Kun Ming, Chai Xi. So these are the members that have kind of, uh, and be promoted to the coming standing committee members. Now, if you see that again, there are like some uh, rules and regulation that has been set into when the the Tang Xiaoping uh, in kind of like institutionalized the whole process, the leadership transition in 1982, that you will one will serve for like two years terms at most, but that have been also altered in. Uh, in the president uh, by Xi Jinping um, in the 19th Party Congress, that there is no restriction on the uh, presidency, so one can go for the third term. But if we see that every like the Congress happens every five years, so that means one Stempolit Muro members can serve for at least for five year terms. Now, if you compare like Xi Jinping and Li Keqiang, then Li Keqiang is like a, a, a 5.5 generation, and then he is going to retire in 20, uh, 2027. Whereas the Xi Jinping is, if he is not continuing, then he will retire in 2022. Now, if this rule is uh, like continue that 68 is going to down, and we have seen that in 19th Party Congress that there was a lot of uh, saying that uh, Wang Kishan will be promoted or kind of like kept into the Politburo Standing Committee, but he was not. So that means uh, the, the process, the tradition of 68 years, it is still continuing. So on the basis of that and, and, the, and the amendment that has been done in the constitution, uh, if we, Try to read into, uh, try to read in, in a kind of like together, then it comes that uh, what will happen. And about, by saying this, I will end my, this, uh, my presentation by saying that uh, there are two scenarios that emerges. One is whether the Xi Jinping continue as a general secretary, and that will be a departure from the tradition that uh, Tang National Life. Now, the second scenario could be is he will relinquish the general secretary but continue as a president and chairman of the army. Now, if Wong Sisan saga tells if is that that maybe that because of to to keep that tradition of 68, Xi Jinping will retire, but there is no rule for now for presidency. There is no term limit, so he can continue with the presidency. Now there is a third very curious things that comes up that nobody is talking about because of the rivalry that we have seen that Li Keqiang and Xi Jinping is not very, they don't have very cordial relationship. But Li Keqiang will be 67 in 2022. Now that leaves a kind of a space for Li Keqiang to continue. Now, having said that if Xi Jinping continues, 
as a general secretary that 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 will end and then Li Keqiang has to retire. That's a scenario. That's a normal scenario that will happen that Li Keqiang and Xi Jinping will retire. But if Li Keqiang continues, then what will happen? Like there are instances in the past where like the the, the premier Li Feng who can, after 10 years continuing as a premier of the China, he became the chairman of Ranta. So there is a, a past experience. Even Chao Chi Yang, the premier who uh, uh, completed his, like not completed his uh, premier, but he then promoted to the general secretary. So there lives a, a space for Li Keqiang, but we don't know but whether or not if there is a compromise between Li Keqiang and the Xi Jinping. Because we have seen in the 19th Congress that there were a lot of expectation that Li Keqiang will be left out for this 19th Party Congress. It will be not uh, in included, but did not happen. So, and but again, there are like some people are saying that if Li Keqiang is continuing, then what will happen to the new generation, that is the sixth generation leader like Hu Chunhua or Chan Min Ar. Now, if th th that, I think, hypothesis is, is void when the Xi Jinping is continuing, because Xi Jinping, if the Xi Jinping is continuing, then again, what will happen to sixth generation leaders? So if in that scenario, what we have seen that there is a compromise or there is a like a, like a cooperation between what we call it uh, a crown prince or like uh, Tuan Pai. If there is a compromise, there is a cooperation between the two and then one can continue uh, living. Rajiv, we have last minute, okay? Yes, yes, sir, yes. Yeah. So I think that leaves a kind of like a space for both leaders, whether they want to continue with the tradition or they want to continue, they want to a little bit abrasion in that process. So having said that, I think uh, there are like, uh, people are saying that uh, Xi Jinping might leave the, the, the general secretary post, but he will continue as a president because there is a kind of like an, a debate between a kind of separation between the government and the party also for only for the sake of governance there at like maybe kind of like a ceremonial post because we have seen in the case of Wang Chi San. So having said that, I would stop here and looking forward to Q&A. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Rajiv. But uh, it uh, appears that under Xi Jinping, there are no ifs and buts, you know. But anyway, I think we'll keep it to the question uh, answer session and let's see if uh, people, you know, uh, are provoked by what you have uh, spoken. So our third speaker in the morning is uh, Dr. Avinash Godbale. He is from Jindal Global University, Sonipat. Uh, Avinash, over to you. You know, he will be speaking on China's Asia strategy under Xi Jinping and its evolution. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Professor Avijit, for inviting me here. Uh, it's great to be once again among friends and colleagues and influencers in China studies uh, for many years. Uh, so. This uh, topic, China's Asia strategy and its evolution, I wrote a little piece on this uh, in 2015, actually, which became uh, a good uh, piece for me. I wrote a commentary in uh, Strategic Affairs on this topic, on China's Asia strategy and its beginning under uh, Xi Jinping. And I thought five years later, it's a good time to relook at it from academic perspective. Uh, and uh, that's what has brought me to into looking into this topic in the last few months. Uh, and I hope I'm able to write down something in this uh, winter break. Uh, as most of us who teach know that, uh, you know, you're not able to read and write China on a daily basis like you used to do in think tanks. So I'm really hoping to turn this into a paper hopefully sooner. Uh, having said that, let me uh, get back to the topic itself. Uh, and uh, previously I have looked at China's Asia strategy into three phases. Uh, into if you divide those in terms of decades and i'm only talking of uh, the asia strategy in terms of uh, china's relations with uh, neighborhood and extended neighborhood in the opening up era uh, more so in the post uh, uh, Deng Xiaoping southern tour which really gave a strong momentum to china's asia strategy which is when china's asia uh, relations in asia became stronger there was recognition uh, in, uh, of China's uh, bilateral relations with many countries in the region, which was not the case. But also the Tiananmen uh, developments, uh, the Tiananmen massacre and the embargoes that China faced. Uh, we have to recall that 
not many of the Asian countries impose those uh, embargoes and trade restrictions on China. And China rewarded those countries uh, well enough by extending trade relations or by starting to import from Singapore and from Japan uh, and South Korea, etc. So that is where the beginning point of my this research really is. So if you divide these three uh, decades uh, from 1990s onwards, I would title the first rough, I mean, not exactly, but roughly the first decade it was about recognition and uh, recognizing these relationships. The second is about capabilities, improving those capabilities. The third has been about power, uh, the extension of power uh, and the unmistakable China rise that we have seen in the last one decade. Uh, that is that decade. And the fourth is influence. Uh, I am keen to look into how China is uh, transitioning from these capabilities to power to influence. And like Jabin mentioned, uh, we are already witnessing this, the search for influence, the search for breaking down historical relations in Asia, uh, this, uh, the desire to break down multilateral arrangements like what China does with ASEAN, uh, which failed to come up with a joint statement, uh, I think twice in the last uh, four years, uh, and uh, the likes. So this transition from power to influence, from uh, being out there, uh, uh, to being uh, the actor who is deciding and then, the, and then the rest of the world is only responding to what you're doing. So China is entering that phase of influencer of the Asia strategy in the last, uh, in, in this decade. And this is why uh, we need to uh, look at it more closely. Uh, we know that China's uh, material capability has been increasing extensively uh, throughout the last 25 odd years, uh, roughly. But uh, does that transit uh, does that translate into power? And uh, those of us who study IR and uh, IR in a theoretical sense, uh, you, you know that power is the ability to get someone else to someone to behave in a manner. Uh, that benefits your interest. And uh, it is really what China is doing uh, uh, right now, using that power uh, and that influence. Uh, so how did it start under Xi Jinping? Uh, and uh, we know that under Mao, there was this uh, world's theory of foreign policy, first, second, and third worlds. Uh, but there was a clear reorientation under, uh, under Xi Jinping uh, and in that, in the last one decade in general, but under Xi Jinping in particular. Uh, by the way, the second tenure of Hu Jintao is actually le leads the foundation of what Xi Jinping is doing. So it's not as if Xi Jinping is completely uh, aberration into the Chinese system and doing something exceptional. Uh, what he has been doing has been continuation of uh, China's power realization in that 2008 uh, all post Olympics uh, phase. So there's more continuity than change. Uh, in terms of uh, fourth to fifth generation, but you know, uh, it was all put into uh, put it uh, it was all put on paper in those two major foreign policy conferences that China did in uh, 2013 and 14. Uh, so uh, the parties work uh, work forum on diplomacy in the periphery was held in October 2013. Uh, that really gave that uh, a new uh, decisive direction to Asia strategy, uh, like I mentioned. Uh, and here Xi Jinping said that, and I quote, we should well introduce China's domestic and foreign policies to the outside world, clearly tell the Chinese story, uh, spread China's voice, integrate China dream with the desire of the people in the neighborhood, etc. Uh, so the desire to uh, present a more benign face and to be of more uh, friendly to the, uh, to the neighborhood. However, Parallel to what happened after this with what happened in the 1990s. So after this uh, foreign policy conclave, you saw the most aggressive phase of island construction in uh, in South China Sea. Uh, and we thought, why is this happening? On uh, one hand, uh, friendly talk, other hand, uh, aggressive posture. But exactly the same thing happened in uh, 1990s. So 1992 was when the Japanese emperor visited China for the first time ever and uh, treated as historic visit, uh, 
seen as China's coming of age and seen as the reordering of China-Japan relations. But in less than four months from that uh, was when China issued the fresh maps uh, and naming the islands of uh, South China Sea and uh, East China Sea, leading to the conflict that we see today. So uh, friendly economic relations and hardening of posture on power status uh, has will go uh, has been going on uh, ha hand in hand uh, in China's Asia strategy. It's not as if the left hand doesn't know uh, what the right hand uh, does. But even then, there was greater e emphasis on uh, friendly postures. Uh, uh, Li Keqiang's uh, first foreign visits also happened uh, in neighborhood, and uh, Xi Jinping also visited uh, Southeast Asia uh, right before the, the work forum. Uh, slightly aggressive posture of uh, what China sees in Asia and how China sees uh, the Asian order was seen uh, when the CICA conference happened uh, in Shanghai in May 2014. So the conference on Western conference building measures in Asia uh, was a long dormant organization uh, meeting periodically but ha not having much influence until this Shanghai meeting because uh, that is when as a chairperson of this event as a host, uh, Xi Jinping gave a speech where he literally said that the security problem in Asia should eventually be solved by Asians themselves through cooperation and I quote any third party uh, uh, in Asia should beefing up of military alliances targeted at the third party. Uh, so that became a kind of a posture for uh, of Asia uh, uh, for uh, for Asians and uh, uh, and that that kind of uh, again gave left hand uh, right hand strategy. You all have seen uh, obviously what the instruments of that policy are and the Belt and Road Initiative, the AIIB, uh, and uh, uh, of course RCEP are the the new instruments of uh, of this foreign policy. Uh, if we have thought that the power uh, phase of China's foreign policy was significant the influence phase of uh, the neighborhood policy is going to be even stronger. Uh, and that is that is translated into dominating uh, academic uh, institutions in Australia or arrest of journalists from uh, these countries and uh, and the espionage operations through, uh, uh, through expats and uh, using of economic strategy uh, for political gains. One of the simplest incidents that I recall was when the <coughs> didn't happen between uh, Vietnam uh, and Chinese uh, in quotes shipping uh, uh, fishing uh, trawlers uh, after that China simply stopped importing uh, food and uh, food uh, rice and uh, fruits uh, for, from Vietnam for a month uh, affecting the exports uh, quite significantly and the economy agrarian economy quite significantly so that is a, a example of influence and we are we have to really brace for that kind of influence uh, to extend even more. Uh, for the lack of time and for the lack of space, I have only uh, focused my uh, initial talk here on the concept. I'm not even going into the COVID slash post COVID discussion because uh, it is still an ongoing field and uh, evolving uh, uh, topic. But as a concept, this is where my uh, idea stands uh, that China as an influencer is emerging. Uh, the, the fourth generational industrial production, the rise of Shenzhen, uh, and China as a uh, 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 as innovator are going to be the next set of uh, guiding forces in that uh, strategy. So I'll stop here. Uh, thank you once again for inviting me and uh, listening to me patiently. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Abhinash. Uh, you again uh, saved. Uh... Sir, can't hear you. Sir, please. Uh, yeah, and I unmute you. I said, thank you, Dr. Avinash, uh, you know, for saving uh, four minutes or so. I hope uh, uh, these are utilized by our audience in the Q&A session. I think two very important points uh, quickly, uh, if I may, uh, you know, intervene. So one is uh, China trying to have sort of like benign influence in the neighborhood, uh, especially in South Asia. 
I, I think it is because of, uh, you know, they believe that uh, this is a uh, disintegrated uh, or, or, or fragmented integration in the region. Uh, in fact, some of the Chinese scholars, so they have also uh, pointed to this uh, defragmented integration in South Asia and China, seeing an opportunity and space for us, you know, for utilizing this uh, sort of uh, uh, defragmented, uh, you know, integration in South Asia. And uh, they're trying to sell, uh, you know, uh, whatever instrument of state policy they have uh, coined over the period of time. And second phase is uh, when they are uh, uh, seeing that India is trying to sort of like block their uh, uh, inroads, you know, in this uh, uh, defragmented, integrated uh, situation, and they try to, you know, uh, jump off the fence and trying to be more uh, offensive uh, and, and uh, uh, you know, bringing in uh, their power and influence, you know, more... Uh, you can say assertively and uh, uh, trying to sort of uh, uh, corner India uh, through uh, a pivot uh, to uh, Asia, uh, incorporating more elements, so which uh, Professor Jabin also you know, made a case of uh, uh, Nepal. Uh, it's quite, quite, quite interesting. I, I, I hope you come up with the full paper you know, <clears throat> in, the, in the coming uh, uh, days and all of us can uh, benefit out of it. Uh, without uh, further ado, so let me invite uh, our uh, fourth speaker, uh, Dr. Sanjeev Kumar. He is a research fellow at ICWA and uh, has been a keen China watcher for a long period in time. Uh, he will be speaking on understanding China's economic reforms since the 18th Party Congress. Uh, Dr. Sanjeev, over to you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, first, I would like to thank uh, Professor Abhijit Banerjee for inviting me to this webinar uh, and also congratulating you for putting together a wonderful conference. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, speak before colleagues and friends in this session. Uh, the, I'm going to speak on China's economic reform since 18th Party Congress. Uh, let me begin my presentation uh, with some highlights from 18th and 19th Party Congress with regard to Chinese economy. Uh, in his report to 19th Party Congress in October 2017, Xi Jinping emphasized that China has entered into a new normal space. He further emphasized the contradiction between unbalanced and inadequate development in China while realizing the goal of Chinese dream. Uh, we know that the party meetings after 19th Party Congress have consistently highlighted China's quest for high quality development as well as challenges facing China. Uh, now I will go back to uh, Hu Chintao's report to 18th Party Congress in November 2012. He sought to implement the strategy of innovation driven development model, adjustment of economic structure, and integration of urban and rural development. Therefore, it is not surprising that the issues of a structural transformation and innovation have received big focus during the Xi Jinping uh, third era. And therefore, we see a, a, a consistency between this 18th and 19th party Congress as far as economic reform uh, is concerned. In this, in this background, I would like to divide my paper presentation into uh, four parts. Uh, first, I would briefly um, uh, talk about the idea of Chinese dream and new normal, mainly because these are the important concepts which shape the economic discourse in China. Uh, secondly, I will be talking about few economic issues which have been debated uh, in uh, China. And in third section, uh, I, will be, I will be talking about the important transitions uh, which are undergoing in China. Chinese experts divide it in traditional and new uh, categorization. So the third section will be talking about traditional transitions and finally about the um, uh, new transitions. Uh, now the, uh, I'll come to the idea of Chinese dream. I think uh, in the inaugural session, uh, Professor Kamal Sil very rightly talked about the historical aspect uh, of the uh, Chinese dream. I, I think uh, uh, broadly, uh, 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 the concept of Chinese dream uh, could be understood from two perspectives. And we know that the 
uh, President Xi Jinping first time talked about the Chinese dream in November 2012. Uh, so the, uh, the first from the perspective, uh, the strategic perspective, we can understand Chinese dream. And, uh, and we also know the historical context could be traced back to uh, China's century of humiliation at the hands of foreign power. Uh, secondly, from an economic perspective, I think the Chinese dream is all about development. The CPC summarizes the two primary goals of China as two centenary goals. The first aim is to double the 2010 level of GDP per capita income and build a moderately prosperous society by 2021 uh, when the Communist Party of China marks the 100th anniversary. The second goal is to turn China into all round modern and socially advanced country by 2049 when uh, People's Republic of China uh, marks its centenary. Uh, we are also aware that recently when fifth plenum of the 19th CPC Central Committee took place, uh, they, they, um, uh, they highlighted the long-term target to, to be achieved by 2035. Uh, now, uh, we, uh, I come to the new normal concept. Uh, we, uh, we know that the term first time uh, used uh, by Xi Jinping during his in inspection tour to Hanan province in May 2014, and after that, the, he has highlighted or he has described this concept many times. Uh, I think the Chinese scholars uh, they have uh, they have argued that the new normal of the Chinese economy refers to a new cycle, a, a cycle, uh, and also a new era of Chinese economy. Uh, uh, but uh, interestingly, they also uh, uh, they also note that the China's microeconomic regulations and implementation of various reforms are facing unprecedented uh, difficulties. Here, I would like to quote an expert from uh, China's National Development Reform Commission, and uh, who says that the uh, that the China has entered into a new normal, which has following five characteristics: number one, slow growth; number two, process of industrial products going down; number three, imbalance between supply and demand; number four, less profitability; and number five, decrease in government revenue. Uh, uh, this could also be seen uh, as a process when high growth rate turns into medium rate uh, as a result of the structural problems of the economy. If, if we analyze the data, we find that from 2013 to 2019, the annual uh, growth rate has declined consistently. Uh, in 2013, it was 7.7, .7, and uh, last year it was 6.1, and so far in the last three quarters, uh, and uh, it's a 0 0.7, we can understand, due to COVID and other factors. Uh, uh, Professor Deepak has uh, referred the, uh, that the, the, the size of the GDP is still very big, uh, or it's an increasing trend, uh, around $14 trillion uh, in 2019, it was noticed. Uh, now I come to the second uh, section of my paragraph, important economic issues, which has been uh, debated. First, I talk about industrial restructuring and supply side reform. Uh, I think um, industrial transfer has become an inevitable uh, trend in China, uh, which is occurring generally in two ways. Uh, first, the transfer domestically from developed region to, to less developed region, and second, uh, transfer to neighboring countries. I think some experts from China Institute of International Studies has, has written that China can also look beyond the border and transfer part of its industries to neighboring countries. And this transfer could be understood as an investment in neighboring countries. So uh, the, uh, from one perspective, I think the BRI could also be understood from uh, this strategy. And now about the supply side reform, uh, it is a very important reform, and, and uh, during the fifth plenum uh, outcomes also, it was highlighted that the China has deepened the supply side re reform, uh, but I think more needs to be done, and uh, if required, I will elaborate during uh, the question and answer session. The second important topic uh, for me is innovation and manufacturing power. Uh, we know that China has established itself as a manufacturing hub. Our ambassador also highlighted in his uh, um, today's speech. Uh, uh, the R&D expenditure has been uh, increased to 2.23% of the GDP. China has also come out uh, uh, with the Made in China 2025 program, uh, which will play a key role in helping China maintain economic growth. 
and and, uh, and move to the global value chain. We know there are problems with this uh, made in China 2025 also. There are studies who, which have established that the um, that lack of capability is still an issue when it comes to implementation of innovation-driven strategy in China. And this was first started, uh, but uh, we got reference to, uh, during the Hu Jintao speech to 18th Party Congress. We highlighted innovation-driven model for China. Uh, but I will I will uh, quote here Premier Li Keqiang, who states that uh, recently uh, during this March speech, uh, that China will make greater efforts to achieve breakthrough in poor technology in key areas. Poor technology is an area where China uh, China wants to um, wants more progress and in equal to the um, Western world. Uh, now I come to the important issue of the state-owned enterprises. The third plenum uh, of 18th Central Committee, CPC, which was held in November 2013, I think they sought to deepen the reform and promote a modern corporate system for SOEs. After that, we found many many uh, party documents highlighted the reform in SOE. Uh, while they were delivering the government work report in March this year, Premier Li Keqiang uh, again sought to improve the performance of uh, SOEs reform and announced a three-year action plan for SOE reform. He noted that SOE should be focused on their main responsibilities and businesses, establish sound market-oriented operating mechanisms, and increase their core competitiveness. Uh, this statement indicates that the long-standing problems associated with the uh, performance of uh, SOE is, is quite evident for the new leadership. But here I would like to um, highlight that SOEs are the biggest interest group in China, Hence, a structural changes is very difficult to be made in China as far as this important sector uh, is concerned. Uh, now I come to the other important issue that is poverty reduction. Uh, I think China has made important uh, progress in this section. Our ambassador also um, highlighted this. Uh, I would like to uh, here go back to the 2016 speech of uh, President Xi Jinping. We do not find a very emotional speech from Xi Jinping uh, for, on the public space. And uh, here he said uh, that it remains a moral and emotional obligation for me to get the tens of millions of rural population out of poverty and let them lead a decent life. Uh, and after that, we found there are many, uh, many targeted poverty reduction programs. If we um, go by the data provided by the Chinese government, by, um, by 2019, only 11 million people are left uh, as a rural people. But we also need to understand that uh, this is based on an extreme poverty uh, line. And, and if we apply a World Bank poverty line, uh, which is either 3.20, or 5.50, if we apply 5.50 dollar per day, for example, if we apply $5 per day poverty line, then around 200 people uh, comes under, uh, the pover uh, under, under poverty uh, in China. Uh, the other important issue is the inequality or regional disparity. Uh, um, here, I would like to just uh, go back to the, uh, the, the, the discussion or discourse when Belt and Road Initiative was launched, the domestic discourse, uh, very significantly or very um, rightly, they talked about the um, they talked about the regional disparity, and their argument was initially that the Belt and Road Initiative will bridge this gap. However, when we now analyze uh, the progress, we find that the uh, provinces which, which are more developed, they have benefited more than the provinces which lags behind uh, previously. So it has contributed to uh, to the um, widening regional disparate, uh, disparity as well. Now I come to the third section of my presentation, which is major transitions which are, um, uh, which are undergoing in China. Uh, so some uh, economists from China have identified uh, these undergoing transitions in terms of traditional and new. Uh, so first I will discuss the traditional uh, transitions the, the first in uh, first is uh, demographic transition and movement of labor force we all are aware that the working age population uh, is declining in uh, china from 2012 and the age of low wages as well as uh, is over and we also found that in some uh, some areas um, uh, my, uh, there was a shortage of migrant laborers or the working laborers 
Uh, I, I will not uh, go into detail again in this section, and if required, I will elaborate in uh, which an answer session. Now, uh, the second important uh, transition is a new type of urbanization. China initiated uh, this new type of urbanization plan in March 2014. Uh, Chinese experts or officials, they stress that the Chinese urbanization drive is different from Western urbanization, as the Chinese plan is to encourage rural people to get settled in the small towns rather than creating slums in the, in the cities. It hoped that urbanization can be main driver of economic growth as the government attempts to shift away from investment or export-based economy. Uh, Premier Li Keqiang has been uh, quoted saying that every rural person who becomes an urbanite can increase consumption by more than 10,000 yuan. Uh, but um, it's not so simple. Um, evidence also suggests that urbanization plan is not very easy to implement, as many rural people uh, do not want to leave the land and shift to uh, to, to a small a small towns or cities. Some Chinese experts have also uh, talked uh, about what they call the process of pseudo urbanization, uh, and they have even termed the, uh, saying that the. Uh, this is uh, this is not working well uh, because the hookah system has not allowed people uh, to get uh, people to get uh, their children uh, admission in school and, and colleges. Uh, uh, finally, I come to the fourth section, which is new transition. Yeah, Sanjeev, you have to wrap up it in uh, one minute. Oh, okay. one minute. Oh, thank you. Um, so uh, the fifth plenum. I talked about the blueprint of 14th five-year plan where they highlighted the uh, concept of du dual circulation economy. In the new transition, um, the, the first comes to consumption transition. We are aware that since 18th party Congress, domestic raising domestic demand has been seen as a source of sustain uh, to sustain economic growth. Uh, the second important transition is service transitions uh, and, and uh, data suggests that if we analyze from 2013 to 2019, agriculture sector contribution to GDP has declined, industry sector contribution has declined, while services has increased from 40, uh, 46 in 2013 to 53 in 9. Uh, and uh, other important transition is digital transition and green transition. Uh, I'm leaving. Uh, if required, I will elaborate in question and answer session. Uh, in the in, in conclusion, I will say that the era of double digit growth is over in China. And government has, a government has initiated a host of policies to ensure China's growth and development in the uh, in, in new normal age. And uh, on positive sides, a number of traditional and new transitions clearly suggest a new focus on consumption and service compared to investment and industry. The middle income uh, income class or middle class, what Professor Chai Fang uh, has highlighted the importance with the vice president of Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, that this domestic group is also replacing ex exports as a main growth driver. Achievements in the fields of poverty reduction are important, but are still uh, debated. However, the reform of state-owned enterprises and issue of poverty rights for farmers have not gone forward uh, in the last uh, uh, 10 years. Uh, some reforms have faced, uh, sorry, the last seven, eight years. Uh, some reforms have faced problems due to lack of people's participation. Experts, experts, especially from Shanghai Academy of Social Sciences, have highlighted this. China is currently um, at a critical stage of economic transformation, upgradation, upgradation and transitions. The challenge to achieve a balanced, uh, inclusive, sustainable, and environment-friendly growth would be seen as a challenge to the Chinese dream of national rejuvenation. With that, I conclude. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Sanjeev. You covered a lot of ground, you know, from uh, new cycle to dual circulation. I hope, uh, you know, uh, there are uh, some questions uh, to you. So let me invite our next speaker, uh, Ms. Saheli Chatraj. She is resident professor in Jamia. Understanding China perspectives from the developmental state. Saheli, over to you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, good Am I audible? Yes, yes, you are. Please start your time. Okay. Thank you, Chair, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. At the onset, I would like to once again take this opportunity to express my gratitude to Professor Abhijit Banerjee for the invitation, and I would also like to take this opportunity to congratulate him for co organizing this conference on this theme of understanding China. 
All other curtsies observed, I would move to the topic of my presentation, Understanding China Perspectives from the Developmental State. Well, I, I, I'm thankful to Sanjeev. He has actually led the uh, ground for my presentation. Uh, so in the, in the beginning, I would like to talk about developmental state and the concept of developmental state. And does China possess the characteristics of being called a developmental state? So from the understanding of the concept of the developmental state, we see that uh, the, uh, it is divided among scholars, one group of whom, uh, uh, of whom consider that developmental state is an in inevitable developmental phase with common features for a backward country to catch up with and surpass the developed countries. On the other hand, there is another group of scholars who believe that the developmental state is actually a dynamic concept and the developmental states at different developmental stages might possess characteristics which are again distinct and distinct and different from each other. However, the most dominant debates uh, regarding the developmental state uh, that has emerged is that when a state regards its economic development as its preferential uh, as its preferential target and the state strives to achieve this target through institutional arrangement and incentive and incentivized structures therefore we see that at the onset of the reform and opening up uh, we see three very important characteristics in the chinese uh, leadership in the, in the chinese politics and chinese economy one is uh, we see the intent of the new leadership from 78 onwards uh, to with the focus on economic reforms. Uh, the reason being that the, le the legitimacy of the CCP had also, also needed to be restored and economy was one of the most important factors. The second was the greater awareness of the West, uh, of the Western prosperity and the reasons and the, of the success of the Western countries and also some of the East Asian countries. And the most important of which was the uh, question of political survival, which required uh, the economic strength in uh, talking in terms of the Chinese uh, 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 Chinese state and the Chinese party. So in 70, uh, 76 um, to 78, we see that there is a reordering of objectives from the uh, which is taking a turn from the political towards more focus on the <clears throat> economic and the and the new leadership we see that they were very uh, they were intent on reforms and how to carry out the reforms and incentivize the reforms through so, so through different in, institutional support and also the success of the reforms was very important and primary for the both the state and the party the party state so uh, and uh, well, again, uh, once again, the reason being the loss of political legitimacy during the years of uh, economic stagnation uh, before that and the political up upheaval during the uh, during the GPCR, which which required an improvement in the living standards and to restore and uh, restore and solidify the political support for the Chinese Communist Party. Failure to promote the rapid economic development would also mean economic stagnation, social tension, and as a result, leading to the political decline. Therefore, the economic reforms were an attempt to re-establish the hegemonic authority of the Communist Party uh, on a different basis. One was by abandoning the Maoist notion of development as a political struggle and attempting to accelerate economic development. Uh, it was, however, hoped that uh, the economic success would provide a new form of legitimacy based on the ability to deliver rapid in, uh, rapid developments in uh, in the economy and in the welfare state. These debates were, however, and these debates and these interpretations were widely accepted, and uh, some of the few some of the scholars who have actually uh, who have actually talked on these. Uh, on the on these debates mostly were like Norton White these were the two scholars and also Keller so there was a second consideration as I mentioned earlier which was the West uh, which was the awareness of the prosperity and the economic success of the West and the Eastern uh, and the East Asian economies so these East Asian economies were also uh, were also following the model of the developmental state to bring in 
to also which in turn also brought in more uh, political stability for these economies so therefore by at achieving like gro achieving rapid growth by harnessing the market and pursuing open economic policies was one of the main aims and it uh, china uh, chi uh, so so china tried to adopt more economic reforms which uh, which had a uh, which was uh, coming away from the policies which it had pursued before for uh, the for strength uh, for strengthening the central uh, central planning and the central authoritarian system the system therefore now concentrated more on discretionary power at the top provided by provided this and it provided the scope for the gradual reform the leadership embarked on two important reform programs not only economic reform but also political reform so which was basically the reform of the state and the party the leadership was modernized by introducing greater professionalism through the use of educational qualifications cadre training and an incentive uh, system that rewarded the achievement of the state objectives uh, and involved performance evaluation in uh, performance evaluation in career promotion which was also seen in the in 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 the party cadres and their elevation within the party structure so therefore the uh, party and state bureaucrats including the and also including the managers of the state owned enterprises were uh, uh, were trained to meet the new ccp objectives which were actually aimed at the achievement of rapid economic growth uh, rapid economic growth therefore the road from central planning to developmental state had to overcome three uh, primary obstacles one being uh, one being the bureaucratic inertia the vested interests or the quanchi that we see uh, before which was very important uh, which was a very important part integral part of the chinese state and society and also the weakness in the leadership uh, which we are, which we again saw in the earlier time so therefore through step by step economic reform uh with one reform leading uh, leading to another the the developmental state the developmental state in china started to make more progress uh china's growth success as we see can be attributed to the nature of china's institutions which may be described as a regionally decentralized authoritarianism so when we when we talk about decentralized authoritarianism uh, we mean that the the political though the political control is centralized uh, centralized at the central government but at the same time the economic management is decentralized to the provinces cities and counties this system has therefore evolved uh, over the uh, over the last few centuries in china and uh, it it is inevitable that many economic responsibilities and powers should were delegated to the regions and the localities however this also created a very uh, unique problem of the principal agent uh, relation in china so uh, we see that there were more principal there were more principals and fewer agents but uh, uh, and therefore uh, for example Uh, despite fiscal decentralization the local governments in many respects were the agents of the became the agents of the central government and as a result of these incentives that the central government provided to the local government so each of the local government also negotiated with their subordinate government for uh, for performance target so when we talk about subordinate government uh, basically the basically the government which Uh, which hierarchically came uh, just exactly below the uh, below the uh, below the one which is in uh, in in role became became to be called as the subordinate government for example for the provincial government the county level government or the city level government were at the subordinate level so there was a, this competition among the local government officials at the same level for example the leaders of the top 3 ranked township in a county they were awarded and uh, they were awarded for their for achieving their economic growth uh, e economic growth and at the same time those who were at the bottom three uh, rank townships were punished so when we say punished uh, it means that their promotions or their elevation in the party structure was stopped or they were even demoted
So there was there was a very strong competition among the provincial leaders to determine the selection process into the national leadership. Therefore, these performance ranking became very important for all of these provincial leaders and the county level and the township level leaders. And these performance rankings of each of the province, counties and uh, townships were also regularly published in the uh, published in the media uh, within China. So there was there was also rotation among, across localities or regions, which was often combined with promotion, which helped to diffuse good practices and strengthen uh, strengthen its connection or its relationship. With so uh, also these kind of rotation among the localities and among the regions also depended on your performance. For example, if if um, if a certain provincial leader or a township leader were was able to demonstrate considerable performance he was later he later had the opportunity to be transferred to a more developed or flourishing uh, region or state uh, region or uh, city so at the same time the central government encouraged therefore encouraged regional experiments as a way of overcoming the resistance to reform and thus reducing the risks of the reform so there were officials uh, who were given incentives and incentives and they were they insisted that they took such initiatives in order to enhance the performance of the performance of at the provincial and at the regional level thus uh, this performance criteria converted many bureaucrats uh, who later chose to took up uh, to sorry to take up entrepreneurship and to become entrepreneurs and they were willing to take risks and uh, indulge into such experiments as well such experiments include the initiation or promotion on, or financing of local investment projects and also overcoming the local institutional and the res resource level bottleneck. So we see that uh, in China, the developmental state arose from the need of the ruling party to restore and maintain the political legitimacy that it had lost earlier. And at the same time, the regionally decentralized authoritarianism was the new model uh, that that slowly emerged in China, uh, that slowly emerged in China. And also the in terms of therefore the economic responsibility and the powers after being delegated to the better informed regions and localities, this this actually created uh, this actually laid the ground for creation of China's personal policies which provided effective incentives for promoting central government's growth objectives. So we see that uh, in the reform, in the early period of the reform. So Haley, two had, minutes. Yeah, yeah, I'll just, uh, I'll just conclude. So we see uh, in the early period of the reform, starting from 78 to, uh, to the early 90s, uh, specifically if we say 91, 92, we see that there was, uh, they started with the, with this model of developmental state. And later we also see that from 92 onwards, the local governments actually got greater, received get greater control rights over the revenue that was generated also that was generated on on the sale of the local land and the local governments could also actually retain the revenue derived from the local enterprises though this policy also underwent like continuous changes and all so uh, i would just like touch a little bit upon the contemporary uh, relevance I, i'll i'll just get done by two minutes so we see that again uh, in the recent times in november 2013 in the third plenary session of the 18 ccp central committee we see they come up they come across with this new policy of again uh to so which was basically to mutual support of each of these provinces so once the once this once it was witnessed that some of the provinces they continue to make um development and move upward in the economic uh, economic scale at the same time some provinces never had the chance or never got the support to do it so they tried to combine two uh, two provinces together which was basically meant by like to uh, for example Guangzhou and Chengdu so Guangzhou which had all the opportunities and uh, uh, and uh, and the parameters to develop and at the same time Chengdu maybe having uh, comparatively lesser lesser opportunities. The same. The second one was the Qing Qi uh, Qing Qi So basically, they started with the Tao. Your Chinchi. time is up. You wrap it up now in just, one minute. Just one minute. I, it's over. I mean, I'm done. 
So and another one was the Cheng Yu Shuang Cheng Jing Ji Chuan. So these were the new uh, these were the new two models that came up. So I would just end with uh, just by mentioning that th there still remains limitations of the developmental state. One being the rapid socioeconomic changes which uh, which are leading to political or socioeconomic instability, and one is again coming to the question of the sustainability of the developmental state in China, which can be debated and I'm uh, happy to answer such questions in the question and answer session. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Sally. Uh, in fact, your paper complemented uh, Dr. Sanjeev Kumar's uh, uh, presentation. So may I have the honor to invite the last speaker of this session, Dr. Swati Mishra. Uh, she is assistant professor, Banaras Hindu University, and uh, her topic is slightly different uh, from others also. Construction of three gorges dam and overview. Swati, over to you. Okay, sir. So, hello to everyone. I would like to begin by thanking the organizers, Abhijit sir, and entire China Bhavan team for giving me this opportunity to be here with you all and to share my presentation with you all. So, I'll be uh, giving an overview on how and under what circumstances this three gorges dam was. Build. So I'll be sharing my PPT. Just a second. I'm really sorry, I'm new to this WebEx, so I will just take a few seconds. Uh, you have already taken one minute. Swati, you please share the entire screen. Share the entire screen. Are you able to upload it? No, I'm not sure that there is a share option available for presenters. Just, just, just give me one second. Just give me one second. Really sorry. Yeah. Uh, I think a share option is there. Just the host will allow you to share. So there is no. Problem. Yeah, I think it has been. Uh... Has already been allowed. <laughs> Yeah, there is a share option. You uh, click on the share, then uh, the entire screen will be shared, then your PPT will be appeared. Yeah. So, uh... yeah, we can see it now. You can go ahead. Uh, am I audible? Yes, yes, you are. Okay, thanks a lot, sir. So uh, I'll be speaking about, like, I will be giving an overview on how and under what circumstances this Three Gorges Dam was built. So the Three Gorges Dam is one of China's most ambitious infrastructure projects. The dam spans the Yangtze River near the town of Santo Ping in the Hupei province. It's 185 uh, meter tall. Yeah, I can't hear you. Not visible. So it's 185 meter tall and 2.3 kilometer long, making it world's largest dam. As per last year's records, it generates 100 billion uh, kilowatt of electricity making it world's largest power station. The construction of the dam took over 17 years. The total cost of the project was estimated 
at around 207 billion RMB, that is 29 billion USD. The dam was first proposed by Dr. Sonia Singh in the early part of 20th century. Uh, he advocated for a series of dams on the Yangtze River with the Heidel uh, Power Dam downstream of the Three Gorges. The nationalist government of China at the time supported his idea, and the initial work began in the 1930s. A survey group was organized, and a series of comprehensive studies were carried out to evaluate hydrological, engineering, economic, environmental, and social concerns. The early survey group compiled a detailed report which suggested a low dam plan at Kerchopa or the Huaning Temple upstream of Yi Chang and Hu Pei. The initial proposal suggested a 12.8 uh, meter high dam with a power generating capacity of 300 megawatt. Dr. Sun strongly believed in international collaborations. And with his initiative, the United States of America became interested in the project. Uh, Mr. Paschal, an American economist, proposed a power plant on the three gorges with a power generating capacity of 10,500 megawatt. On this proposal, the then Kuomintang government invited Dr. John L. Savage, a noted dam expert and chief engineer from the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation, to China in 1944 to survey the area and give his feedback. Dr. Savage's proposal suggested 200 meter high dam somewhere between Nanjing Quan and Shifei, 5 to 15 kilometer upstream of Yichang. At almost the same time, an Austrian engineer Pai Lang Tu who was advisor to the Yangtze River Water Resources Commission, suggested that carrying out the project would be difficult given the social and political turmoil in the China. The KMT government launched a series of surveys to study the feasibility of the special service proposal. In 1945, the Three Gorges Hydropower Planning and Technical Committee was formally established and started exploring various issues such as the reception resettlement of people, irrigation, and navigation. However, with the breakout of uh, Chinese Civil War in 1947, everything was stalled. Uh, in 1954, the Yangtze flooded, and 33,000 people died. Mao Zedong began to sense that need for the construction of a high, big dam on the river. In 1955, Soviet experts were called in to provide technical and planning assistance in the dam project. Uh, thereafter, an overall coordinating body, the Yangtze Valley Planning Office was established. However, concerns arose even from within the party. In 1957, Mao Zedong launched the 100 Flowers Campaign with, the, with which open opposition to the Three Gorges project started surfacing. In 1958, Mao's advisor Li Ri suggested to Mao to delay the construction of the dam. With the end of Vanuatu coming in 1976, the state focus came back to development projects. The state began to rethink the dam, uh, 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 to making the dam, so as to permanently solve the problem of Yangtze floods. Furthermore, with China's growing population of industrialization, the energy demand was ever increasing. Proponents of the dam, including Premier Li Feng, uh, Tang Xiaofeng, Poning Liu, Yomei, and Kuo Shu Yun, argued that, the, argued that the dam could provide around 10% of China's entire energy demand. A team was made to decide the location of the dam. A first feasibility study was conducted by the Yangtze Valley uh, Planning Office in 1982 to 1983, and it recommended a 175-meter high dam. However, over the next few years, significant opposition surfaced in China. In 1986, Sun Yue-chi and other senior experts of the Economic Construction Group of the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference conducted a 38 days field trip along the project site. Upon their return, they recommended to Beijing that 
the project should not go ahead in the short term because it cost would be three times the official estimates. On this, Li Ri, a uh, noted Chinese historian and a very influential Chinese politician, also Mao's secretary on industrial affairs, he advised that scientific principles should be considered in the TGP assessment. Uh, in 1989, the events took a major turn as a result of actions from public intellectuals. A group of journalists, public figures, engineers, and scientific uh, scientists opposed the project and questioned merit of the dam. Their opinions were published in Yangtze Yangtze, a book edited by Tai Chi. It was an extensive collection of analysis, essays, and interviews with prominent Chinese intellectuals, experts, and politicians. Uh, in this book, they discuss the environmental concern of the dam. Uh, finally, the book was banned in China in October 1989. The government even ordered the publishers to recall the remaining 30,000 copies and destroy them. Tai Ching was denounced by the official media, and she was secretly detained by the police in July, uh, in July 1989. After a few days, she was imprisoned in Xinjiang province. However, she had uh, uh, previously managed to smuggle a couple of copies of the book to Britain and Canada. Uh, consequently, the uh, Chinese state the uh, uh, Chinese state felt a lot of pressure. Uh, and uh, it was the first time in the history of China that public intellectuals had uh, managed to influence state policy in a major way. The Far Eastern Economic uh, Review called the book as a watershed event in post-1949 Chinese politics. So, uh, uh, well, uh, I personally had this opportunity to uh, discuss this with Tai Singh, uh, uh, and interview her uh, thrice on this topic. So, however, in late. Yes, Swati, I cannot hear you. Uh, I don't know if you are audible to other people or not. No, not audible, sir. It's, it's... Yeah, I think uh, we lost her. So, under such circumstances, what do we do? I don't know if she is reconnecting or, in fact, uh, she... So just wait to... for a minute if, if he's reconnecting, sir. Yeah, she is about to exhaust her time also. I think what we can do, maybe we can wait for her. Meanwhile, there are some questions already uh, coming on uh, on the screen. So maybe yes, sir. we can start with that, you know, otherwise uh, we will right, be sir, wasting right, time sir. because we don't have much time. It's already 12.55 and we were supposed to have at least 10 to 15 minutes of discussion. So I right, think we'll sir. wait for uh, Savati with the permission of the organizers and then we can uh, continue with our Q&A. So there are already two questions uh, on uh, uh, the... Sir, uh, there was a power cut. I'm really sorry and it got disconnected. So can I continue? Yeah, then you have to finish it maybe within two minutes quickly. Uh, okay, sir. Yeah. 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 So it was a coincidence that in 1991, Yangtze flooded. The flood affected more than one fifth of the country's population, while around 2,025 people died, 50,000 were injured, and 9 million houses were damaged. A proponent of the dam argued that not building the dam amounted to floods. The State Council Examination Committee passed the project in 1991. So, a final approval and the construction of the dam. The official plenary session of 7th National to 
April 3rd, 1992. In this uh, Yeah, I think we have uh, lost her again. Organize sir, this. Sir, we can start with the QA session, sir. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, so, uh, so I think uh, the first question I see uh, here, it is uh, for uh, Dr. Rajiv uh, Ranjan. And uh, the question is that, is there any law amendment for the power for Premiership as well, we can expect Premier Li Keqiang uh, to be extending his uh, premiership just as President Xi Jinping as well. If it is so, how it is going to affect China's democratic policy? So this question is for Rajib. Rajib, you would like to answer it? Or shall I read out the question post to other people as well? And then maybe, you know, uh, uh, panelists can answer them one by one. As you wish, sir, as you wish. Okay, so then let me read uh, other questions uh, also. And the second question is, uh, uh, it is posed to, uh, uh, no, in fact, I think the first question was for, for Sanjeev. Yeah, Sanjeev, I'll also read out your question. Recently, China has announced that uh, China has succeeded in their mission of poverty elevation. Uh, however, there was not much publicity in this announcement. Is this China uh, is still not uh, confident with their own data? Uh, so this is posed by Abhijit. Uh, so this is the question to uh, Dr. Sanjeev. And then I'll uh, read out another question. Uh, this question is uh, for, uh, uh, it is, uh, I think it must be for Jabin uh, because uh, it has not, yeah, I think it is for Jabin. Jabin, you may listen to uh, this. Uh, this is Bidisha Seth, a student of China Bhavan. My question is to Jabin, sir. Sir, you talked about China building an influence over Nepal and why is China so keen on that? Sir, uh, I mean, this uh, going. Uh, sir, uh, what could be the possible reason for Nepal to show equal amount of interest to join hands with China and opposing the media on any speech against China? Another uh, question is again, I believe, uh, to Professor Jabin. Uh, and the question is, uh, uh, is she is uh, Satyaki Ganguly? No, I, I can, okay. I, I saw the question. I can, yeah. I can answer that, no problem. I've okay, seen the question so, in the chat. So maybe I'll not read it out. Uh, and uh, this is another question, uh, Ankush Bhattacharya. A student of China of heaven. My question is to Avinash. Sir, uh, sir said that China is uh, taking aggressive measures against some countries and at the, at the same time talking about to cooperation with those countries, especially in respect to economy. So I want to know how are these uh, aggressive measures taken by China uh, are affecting the economic cooperation with these countries. And another question for Jabin, I think you are bombarded with a lot of questions. So you must have read all your questions what have been posed to you. So since maximum questions are to you, Jabin, so could you please uh, go ahead first you know, with your answers? Okay, thank you. Um, uh, let me also sort of, uh... Thank everyone for their questions, uh, and I will first of all start with the question that Professor Deepak uh, posed. Uh, does China, and I think it answers to other questions as well, does China in view India as a strategic competitor? 
Uh, I think certainly it does, but uh, the way the Chinese um, foreign policy system is now wired is to see the United States as the primary competitor. So if the Chinese were to look at India as a principal competitor, then there will be questions raised about, okay, how is China going to compete with the United States if it cannot handle India? Which is why I think this latest uh, uh, problem on the LAC and India's reaction to it has set off probably, I think, uh, some amount of confusion within the Chinese system. So officially, China will never acknowledge India as a competitor or as a peer uh, rival, because uh, that would uh, mean that China has a long way to go before it begins to challenge the United States. So that's not happening, so which is why the Chinese have a problem with uh, that millennium uh, agreement between India, uh, between Nepal and the United States, because China's position is that Asia for Asians uh, and that the United States must stay out of uh, Asia or anywhere in China's neighborhood so that China can dominate, which is why the Chinese are against uh, the United States in Afghanistan as well. Uh, specific questions. Um, uh, China is uh, to Bidisha's question. China is key to build influence on Nepal because China thinks it it deserves or it, uh, Nepal is a China's neighbor, and that uh, you know China must have a place of influence in Nepal because China is number one in Asia, and therefore it must cut out India if it's possible, or at least compete on equal footing with India uh, as much as possible. Nepal is interested obviously because Nepal uh, doesn't want to be dominated by India. It doesn't want to be dominated by China either, so it will try and play off India and China against each other. But it remains to be seen how much capacity Jack Nepal will have to do that. Uh, on Satyaki's question about uh, the Chinese recruiting Gorkhas, I think that's extremely unlikely. But the Chinese are certainly against the idea of Gorkhas being recruited into the Indian Army. Can good China-Nepal relations trigger turmoil in Darjeeling? I think, you know, the record already shows that there is some revival of Chinese uh, uh, support for insurgencies in India's Northeast. So I do not uh, for a moment doubt that if the Chinese have the opportunity, they will stir up trouble everywhere along India's borders. Uh, and, you know, one can't blame the Chinese beyond a point because if there is trouble that is possible that can be stirred up, then it is so much about, it's also about Indian uh, political system or India's uh, approach to dealing with political problems in its own borders. On the Mahasarovar Yatra to Kalapani, um, well, you know, the road has been constructed, but that has then triggered re a reaction from the Nepalese. So I'm not sure just how much this will go through. This will have to be uh, uh, seen. Uh, Joy, this question about China, new best friend of Nepal, not India. I think uh, it's too soon to say anything of that sort. But the Chinese uh, might try, but they are nowhere near the level of influence that India has uh, in Nepal. I mean, look at KP Oli now, the prime minister in Nepal, who is now again going to, uh, I mean, seeking Indian support. Uh, Avijit's question is important, which is that uh, the role of the Chinese consul, uh, the ambassador in, Jem in Nepal and the uh, you know, the equivalent role of the Chinese Consul General in Calcutta and some other countries. Uh, no, I wouldn't say that the Consul General in China in Calcutta is not proactive. I think they're sort of laying low for the moment because of the troubles on the border. But uh, the propaganda efforts continue. I mean, the Chinese embassy in Delhi has launched a tough competition for them, launching all sorts of events to try and get Indians to uh, forget about the boundary dispute as it were. Uh, and that uh, effort will be constant. Uh, it's us who need to be alert against it. Uh, the Consul General in, uh, in Calcutta has a particular role in, which is about uh, the graves of uh, Republic of China soldiers in Ranchi, which the Consul General in China of in Calcutta is trying to dominate. I think that is something that you need to pay a little more attention to. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Javin. Uh, in fact, there is another question, but anyway, uh, you know, uh, uh, yeah, the last question uh, again for you, maybe if you can spend the 10 to uh, 20 seconds. It's by Ravinda, Ravinda Kumar. How do you see the recent protest by masses uh, to reinstate monarchy system in Nepal? Oh, 
I I'm not an expert on Nepalese politics, but I should imagine that this is uh, there's no going going back to the monarchy. Um, and look, you should remember that the Chinese don't care who's in power, as long as it is a power that can support the Chinese. The Chinese are happy to support the Taliban for democracy. Uh, they'll support whoever will speak on behalf of the Chinese, who will oppose the Americans, who will oppose the Indians. So that is the bottom line for the Chinese. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I think uh, next two minutes each to uh, Dr. Rajiv Ranjan, Dr. Avinash Godbole, and Dr. Sanjeev Kumari. Thank you, sir. Uh, I have two questions. One by Hem Kusum, ma'am. I answered asking how this uh, this abolishment of term limit uh, for president has generated debate in China among the students and the, the scholars. Uh, as we see from the outside, we see as like it's a return of Mao 2.0. But what the Chinese scholar and Chinese student the debate is, they are saying that at the right, this is the moment that is China needs to have a very political and economically system that is more stable and can be give, uh, give a befitting reply to 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 US and any other who is eyeing on China. So I think for them, this is they are looking this amendment as to continue the Chinese uh, robust system and they are like um, sure that under the Xi Jinping that can continue without going into a kind of uh, leadership trouble within the China. Now the second question is about whether or not there is a uh, maybe there will be amendment in the premiership. Uh, I don't think there will be a prim, uh, amendment for this uh, premiership in there because there are two reasons. One is that the Li Keqiang or the premier can still have one post to go, like the, there is the general secretary and the president also. So they, do, they don't need any uh, amendment uh, to, to, to promote Li Keqiang. Uh, and another one is like, uh, we haven't seen that the premier is not regarded as a kind of like a main a force within the China. So, so I don't think there will be a kind of amendment. Um, so by saying that this whole scenario has generated a kind of like a very much uh, heated debate within China and they are like still waiting their uh, like breath like to see that what happens in 2022, uh, whether uh, Xi Jinping is going to continue or Xi Jinping is going to become another Tang Xiaoping. Like what we see is all people are saying that they, they are China, uh, Xi Jinping is going to become another Mao, but there is a voice in, within China that they are saying that might Xi Jinping replace all the post and kind of like advisory board chairman and that continue with the chairman military. So there are like huge debate within the China, like how uh, Xi Jinping is going to continue or they are going to keep this tradition alive since 1982. I will stop here. Thank you, Dr. Abhinash. Yeah, so uh, the, the question is about uh, the two-hand strategy and how it's affecting economic relations. Uh, you really have to see the entry of Japan in the Southeast Asian scenario as a partner in Philippines and Vietnam and dialogue partner and trainer. So it's clear that uh, the smaller countries are not waiting for China to amend its ways and they are uh, balancing uh, China uh, by talking to other countries. I'm sure uh, South Koreans also uh, face that uh, challenge, uh, especially in the way China reacted to the Thard and uh, other uh, issues subsequently. Uh, you, so you don't expect uh, countries like South Korea, which are too dependent on China economically, uh, to speak out in issue in favor of, uh, say, issues like Indo-Pacific or Quad that openly but there will be tacit support uh, of those and you can uh, that that will be visible in the way their economic relations uh, shape once again with uh, southeast asia uh, asian countries and with uh, uh, perhaps with india in the future and there have been uh, trends of that uh, in the last couple of years i would say thank you dr sanjeev over to you yeah thank you uh, i have two uh, questions uh, first uh, uh, from Professor Abhijit Panerjee, uh, that China has announced that it has eliminated uh, poverty, but it's not celebrating about the data. Uh, I think uh, there are experts who doubt the data from Chinese uh, government, uh, but the fact remains that we do not have credible alternative sources to know.
Yeah, I think uh, we have lost uh, Dr. Sanjeev. So maybe his connection is uh, poor. And in this uh, situation, I don't know until he connects back. Uh, Saheli and Swati, would you like to utilize uh, this opportunity to just maybe take one minute each? I don't know if there's any question directed to me. Yeah, there, there so, is no question. Yeah, there is no yeah. question. Yeah, so, uh, so if you want, I can address the last question, global slowdown and Chinese economy. Though it's, it's not directed to anyone, I guess. No, it's to Rajiv, so, yeah. There is a question to Swati, I think, sir. Swati, I, I must have missed it. Uh, Swati, uh, did you read your question? Because I didn't read it. I think the second last one, sir. I cannot second read the question, sir. Uh, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe yeah, Swati then. Yeah. Maybe Swati, you can read it and then answer it. Sir, I cannot read the question because my connection was okay, not... Okay, now I will read it for you. So you please listen. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. If Swati ma'am is present here, then one question to her that a few days ago, there was a news that India to construct construct a water reservoir on Brahmaputra in Arunachal to counter Chinese construction. Is that enough? Uh, well, I don't have uh, uh, answer to this question because I don't know if it's enough or not. Uh, uh, and uh, I cannot say that it was to encounter China. Uh, uh, yeah, so. Yeah, but anyway, I think there is a lot of uh, yeah. politics on the damming of uh, yes, uh, Brahmaputra. Yeah. And of course, there are uh, uh, two constituencies. One sees it as a weapon being used by China against India. And that is another who says that India need not to worry about because uh, yeah. you know, most of the uh, uh, mightiness of the Brahmaputra, it is formed in the lower riparian areas that is inside Indian borders. And uh, according to one study, if you uh, consider the volume, water volume of Brahmaputra inside Indian borders, so it amounts to 610 billion cubic meters. So that is almost tantamount to six yellow rivers inside China. But of course, it will have a great uh, impact as far as ecology, fauna, flora, and even you know the maybe uh, the the, the uh, fertility of the soil is concerned. Of course, uh, these the, these are some of the issues. Maybe I can address it for you. Uh, with this, uh, uh, I think we have overshot our time uh, by almost fourteen uh, minutes. I take this opportunity to thank all the panelists for the brilliant uh, uh, presentations and also thank the, uh, the the students and audience those who intervened and asked uh, questions i absolutely enjoyed the session i think uh, i have already chipped in for my comments i will not uh, you know uh, take much of the time uh, just to conclude that it was a brilliant session and uh, uh, the uh, the, 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 the kind of audience and the people, the scope of China study, the India, it is expanding. And I congratulate Abhijit, uh, Professor Abhijit Banerjee, you know, for at least taking some of the glare away from New Delhi. Thank you all and have a brilliant session uh, tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Deepak, sir. And thank you all the speakers for your very informative, informative and significant uh, deliberations. We thank you all for joining us today and enlightened us with the knowledge that you have shared today. So uh, with this, we conclude the first academic session of which is held to, which was held today. And then our next session will continue from tomorrow. And the session links of the, we have three session, sessions tomorrow and the links will open for registering. Uh, <laughs> I think the time will start. Uh, the time of session is from 10 a.m. in the morning, and the people can enter the link with the links. I think you already have got an email with the uh, link. So with this, I thank you all for joining us, and today we conclude this session up to this, right? Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all for joining. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.
Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Chair.